The last thing I want to talk about is balanced cross sections. Have you ever looked at the cross sections in the textbook or in a paper or on a website and wondered, yeah, that looks cool. How do we know it's accurate? How do we know it really looks like that? To help make sure that cross sections are as accurate as possible, geologists have a set of criteria to determine if a cross section has a chance of being correct. Now, we know that we're not getting everything perfect, but we want to know is it does it even have a chance of being correct or really close to correct? And so there are four fundamental tests that we have to use when creating a cross section. The first test is that although cross sections are going to have some amount of exaggeration or deformation, um, you know, vertical exaggeration, for example, is a large, you know, standard type of exaggeration. Um, the cross section should resemble real structures observed in the field. For example, you know, this is labeled Mount Crandall. It should look like a mountain in your cross section. You know, if it looks like a valley or a, a flat plain, you're probably not drawing it right. The second test is that if you restore the cross section, basically taking all these, you know, faulted layers and folded layers and try to spread them back to their predeformed state, it should yield reasonable geometries. So if you can't take it and flatten it back out, it can't be right. You know, if you take some Play-Doh and, you know, cut it to create a fault and you slide it along the fault, you can take it and slide it back and have it in the original position that you know is realistic because you made it out of Play-Doh. It existed. However, if you are doing a drawing, you didn't start with something physical. You're just sitting there drawing. But you can extrapolate, you can figure out what it would look like if you straightened them out, if you extended it back to before there was all that compression and folding and faulting. For example, this cross section up here on the top, if it were stretched out to its original condition, would look like this. And this is reasonable. The layers actually match up, the shapes fit as they get flattened, this cross-section is passing the test. Test 3, very similar, it must be area balanced. Meaning that as we stretch and straighten this back out, the area, the cross-sectional area of what we've drawn has to match. We can't, well, you know, we, we straighten these out and there was a gap, so we just connect the lines and fill it in. No, that doesn't work. You know, all of those lines represent rock. We can't destroy rock. We can't create rock. The rock present in the cross-section must all exist no more, no less, in the restored cross-section. If that can't work, then you know there's a problem with your cross-section. And the very last test is that it must be kinematically reasonable. So there's that lovely word from your physics classes that you hoped that 
you'd never see again. Kinematically reasonable. Well, if you remember back to physics class, kinematics is the physics of motion. So this is looking at the motion based on the stresses. So can it logically happen? You know, we've got the cross section. We have the restored cross section with the traces of the faults and the layers. And so the question is, could you, you know, if you had the time, draw an animation showing, hey, the stress is like this, and these are moving like this, and have the steps between this restored one at the bottom and the current one at the top, and have it actually make sense. You know, if you have continual compression, for example, is it continually shortening? Are the thrusts, or are the faults thrusting properly? Are they folding properly? Is it doing what you'd expect from continual compression? Or do you have to explain it with like, oh, there was you know, compression and then there was tension and then there was compression and then there was uplift and you know, some complicated convoluted explanation just to make your cross section happen? Or does it make sense that, hey, you know what? We know from other studies nearby there was compression for 30 million years in this area, so my cross section has to form by just continual compression. Yes, it works. No, it doesn't work. I can't explain it. You know, I can explain it. Does it work kinematically? Is it reasonable? We obviously can't go back and, you know, stick video cameras and GPS and stuff like that and see what was happening over 30 million years. But we can logically deduce, does it work? Could it have actually happened this way based on the forces acting on the rock? So the reasoning is that the first two tests make sure that you have a realistic geometry. Can it actually fit together? Could it happen from flat continuous beds to end up the way you've drawn it? The third test makes sure that you're not destroying or creating mass. We're not God, we're just geologists. We can't create or destroy mass. We just have to draw pictures that are realistic based on the law of conservation of matter. And then the fourth test is to make sure that it could actually logically form and that you understand how it formed. Now you don't actually have to go through and do an animation but you know if you've done the reconstructed one you can logically in your head see how all of it happened in succession. That's what you need to be able to do. That's what geologists do when they draw really good cross sections. So that's all of this chapter that we're going to cover this week.